Hello and welcome to the Tools in the Shed podcast brought to you by Cars Guide where we'll talk about cars and no doubt other stuff that we've come across during our week. And I'm Matt Campbell and with me this week is Stephen Corby who's been attempting to come to grips with an Italian stallion uh, and has some gripes he'd like to discuss about a certain type of transmission. Rocky has a transmission? <laughs> What's yes. Rocky? Uh, stallion. Also yeah. joining us is Mal Flynn, who's been slip sliding in the snow and also sampling what could be Mazda's biggest selling model in 2020. That's a big one. Mm. On top of all that, we'll update you on the weird and wonderful world of Elon Musk in this week's Musk Watch. So stay with us. First of all, though, let's talk some feedback from our lovely listeners. Uh, Stephen Davis said he's loving the podcast. And he's had his say on the local car industry, suggesting there's an increase in older cars on the road. And it could have something to do with new car sales hitting the brakes this year. Do you guys notice anything in particular on the roads? You're not noticing less I'm always on the lookout for old cars. (laughs) And uh, I haven't noticed a blip on my... uh no? My seat of the pants graph. <laughs> it would be amazing to notice that, I think, as you drive around. It's quite a statistical anomaly to notice older cars. When you consider how many cars are in a given day, how many of the old... No, I haven't seen it. Okay. And well, given the market has hit the skids by 8%. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Uh, so maybe there are it, maybe some not-so-old cars, but just slightly older than brand new. Maybe. Mm, it's possible. Uh, Hammer Rocks had his say on digital dashboards. Now, last week, Tung made a case for the digital dash, and Hammer reckons there should be more customization available for the screens in front of the driver, like fonts or skins, even a Hello Kitty theme. <laughs> um, <laughs> Be better that than on the parcel shelf. Yeah, I suppose so. Uh, He also questioned the durability and reliability of these sorts of screens because interior tech can be one of those things that's hard or near impossible to replace if something goes wrong. Uh, What do you guys reckon? I reckon that's a good argument for standard size screens. Yeah. Uh, As in, you know... um, you know, a standard 16 to 9 orientation so that hopefully in the years to come you'll be able to go to your screen replacement shop yeah. and just whack in a new one. Like those little pop-up stores in the in the malls where you, you get your iPhone. Mobile yeah. phones, yeah. yeah. I must remember when Audi came out with a virtual dashboard and they said, oh, you can you can personalise it and change it and then you realise you actually used it all it could do was two different things. <laughs> oh, just the two things you've got then, nice. <laughs> and but your the, passenger can't do anything anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But I did go to the launch of the new Ferrari SF90 SF90 Stradale, and that has the most amazing screens I've ever seen. They've actually bent the glass, so the glass bends in front of you. Imagine an iPad with curvature. So the the lushness of that screen is incredible, and and it does have several settings. That's probably really good for glare reduction. Mm. Yeah, they said that. It was actually brilliant for glare. It's much better. Mm. Yeah, it's yeah, probably the clearest. Mo- I mean, we we looked at it in a dark room, but um, <laughs> it did. Uh, there was I wasn't no allowed glare. to drive it or anything. But uh, it was a really weird launch. Yeah, <laughs> it was very strange and unveiling. But uh, yes, it was uh, it was spectacular. They've finally beaten Audi, I think, in terms of interior screen, you know, of you know, driver screens. Okay, interesting. Wow. You'd want to for a million dollars. Um, we also had a comment from Ms. Solar uh, commenting on the Citroen C5 Aircross review by Richard Berry, stating, "I really miss Richard Berry reviews." Please never stop being different and unique. I'm not really sure what you mean by you really miss him. He hasn't been anywhere. But um, That's not Terry, was it? There's Miss Mum? No, it was Miss Sola. Oh, okay. Um, oh, so, Terry, if you're watching. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks for the comment. And there's plenty more Richard Berry reviews on the channel. Uh, and UFO35 and Ole Carrad Larson both stated that a car without car play is off the cards for them based on Tom's review of the new Qashqai ST Plus, which doesn't have car play. Yeah. Uh, what do you guys think? Car play, you're an Android user, but Mel, what do you it, think? If you haven't got either of them, then I'm sorry, you're not a player. Yeah. It's, we've reached that point. Uh, where if you've once you've used it and become accustomed to it, you just don't want to go back. And if you're BMW and you're charging extra for it, Rude. please go to hell. They've, <laughs> it's just um, I've noticed this week uh, in the UK and the US they've announced that they're doing the subscription model, which has been in place in Australia for a little bit longer. And there's out outrage, you know, uproar. Mm. They're thinking that this is ridiculous. Why why should other brands give it to you for free? The BMW version does give you wireless CarPlay, which is a, an advanced version of it, and it is better. There's no doubt about that. If you don't have to put a cable into your phone yeah. when you get in the car. But that's not why they say they're doing it. They're no. saying, oh, they said it so that you'll have the most up-to-date version. But hang on, who updates it? Is that you or Apple? 
Oh, it's Apple. Yeah. Are you giving the money to Apple then? No, we're pocketing the money. <laughs> and <laughs> it's yet, crazy. A fifteen thousand dollar key per count, yeah. yeah, straight Get out of the box. Yeah. But I was in an Uber the other day with a guy who bought the new three series and he couldn't get his car play to work. I said, Man, I've got nothing but bad news for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not only can you not get it to work, but when you do, you're gonna get a bill. <laughs> well, why was he Ubering in a new three series? I was impressed. And yeah. It wasn't I only, I only take the Uber whatever it is. Uber mm. Rolls Royce, what's yeah. that option? Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, and we also had another comment on uh, the Cash Kai ST Plus review um, from Callum Belotus. Uh, and remember, this was uh, our own Tom White doing the review. And the comment was, this guy is such a hunk. <laughs> I'm oh, sick of people on. saying that on my reviews. <laughs> Uh, look, you know, we know have what? to, we've got to draw the line You've got somewhere. To edit them. So, yeah, we've got to vet them. Gets, um, the, gets too much. The hunk trophy cabinet. All Chester's right. Chester's never had that. <laughs> uh, so moving on, this week, uh, Mr. Corby, have you been interacting with a car with a CVT? Now, CVT, if you're not aware, is a continuously variable transmission. We've Lots got a great story on the site written by one Stephen Corby explaining the differences between CVTs and torque converters and such. There you go. I've had to have therapy to remove that story from my memory. <laughs> Just, just writing about it makes me sad. But no, uh, it was in a Lexus that I don't remember the name of. It's a Lexus. I started nodding off every time I got in it. Right. And it's just mainly the CVT that does me in. Right. If there's a CVT in any car, uh, to me, it feels like some kind of sleep therapy. The opposite of sleep therapy. If you were asleep, it was torture. <laughs> Nightmare therapy. It's, to me, it's like it's like motorways. Motorways are a great idea, but God, they're boring. God, they're boring. But they get you there quicker. They're more efficient. They're safer. But God, they're boring. But I love new tech, and when they when they explain CVT the first time, and your first time you drove a car, you're like, this is going to be great. And you get up there, and it revs up to 4,000, just sits there, and you go, oh, this is awful. <laughs> like, everything about the user experience is awful. Yes, it makes sense, and it's saving me fuel and whatever. So, but the user experience is not pleasant. It's the opposite. It's, it's really quiet. And I guess, I guess if people don't care about driving or the thrill of accelerating through gears or any of that, if that doesn't matter to you, then the it's a the perfect, with the car and the the perfect transmission. Yeah. Experiencing so the mechanics it is weird enjoy. that we're seeing it applied in different models that do have performance connotations, like the WRX. Mm. It has a CVT or the Lavorg as well. It, it's weird, I think, that these sorts of transmissions are making their way into performance cars. But they do offer that uh, the fact that they're um, they're cheap to manufacture. That's yeah. one part of it. Uh, generally, pretty reliable. Uh, not like a dual clutch transmission, which could be more prone to things going wrong. And are also just inherently complex. Yeah, mm. exactly. Twice the moving parts for normal manual transmission. Exactly. Auto. And they do help uh, reduce your fuel consumption. So I think in the in the broader scheme of things, there's a good reason that so many brands are going for a CVT like Toyota. I mean, some of their CVTs are the best CVTs in the business. There's other brands like Nissan, which don't do a fantastic CVT. Honda, uh, they're getting better. Better. They've introduced the stepped ratios, which so many brands are trying to introduce to their autos. Which, which is, is an inherent compromise in the function of a CVT. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. needs to be continuously variable yeah. to do its job. Exactly. Not stepped. But, anyway. but it gives you that sensation of, oh, it's a real transmission. Mm. Does that count for something? I guess for me, it's just if, if you love driving, personally, I love manual gearboxes. I love manual gearbox. So the, the enemy of my driving experience is the automatic. But yep. then the CVT takes it to another level where it's my nemesis. It's actually, you know, mm. every, it couldn't be more wrong in terms of user. But I absolutely accepted all the benefits. Yeah. As I said, on paper, it's a wonderful idea. It's just the user experience is tough. And is that the Toyota ones are better? But it's still, it's still a sense in that, in that car, it feels like the car doesn't have a transmission at all. Okay. It's like... So then you're getting into electric car territory, which is another another thing altogether. Which I which I must admit I love the 100% torque from zero RPM thing. That's fine by me. Yeah. But I think that's probably what we're all going to end up with. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I reckon it would start to feel a bit dull after you know 365. They'll days be putting steps in. They'll be putting yeah. steps into a single tr- and single gear transmission. <laughs> yeah. Good luck with that. Kicking well, we did see. Uh, I think earlier this week um, was it ZF that uh, might have been last week. They introduced a two speed electric. Uh, transmission. Oh, really? Yeah. So go, one. That's yeah. two. That yeah. One. Is, that, two. Is these, that is a huge solution for range anxiety. Yeah. Just to have a second ratio. Yep. My goodness, that will help. Mm. Yeah. So, and we all know range anxiety is a big issue for Australians, um, mm. not so much other people in the world who realize that they don't actually drive that far. But let's uh, talk about going afar. Mal, you've been somewhere cold. Ah, yes, somewhere this week. beautiful yes. and somewhere with Volkswagen. Tell us all about it. I did indeed. So uh, I spent the first half of this week uh, near uh, Queenstown in New Zealand on the mm. South Island at a place called Cardrona or specifically the Southern Hemisphere Proving Ground, which has a network of ice circuits, uh, which is very un-Australian, but pretty good place to test a car to its absolute 
limit, you know, remove every, almost every f tiny element of fraction from the equation, of uh, friction, sorry, from the equation. And so, yeah, we drove uh, most of Volkswagen's four motion all wheel drive lineup on ice. Uh, including the Crafter van, the big van. Wow. Which cool. was pretty hilarious. <laughs> so, because the Crafter is traditionally front wheel drive or rear wheel drive, do you know? Rear. Rear. Because it's got the north south okay. uh, engine layout. But um, so this one was all wheel drive. Uh, and the the new craft, which came out last year, this yeah, year, or last year, last year, year. Yeah. later half of last year, yeah. actually has the Heldex system from the um, related to the ones in the uh, the Golf and the Passat, etc., which is the more advanced setup that um, actually predicts if you're going to enter into a slide, yeah, um, rather than the Torsen setup, which is in the Tuareg and Amarok, yeah. Um, but anyway, it's it so on the surface it seems really unrealistic for Australian drivers, but it's amazing what it did in a situation where you could not walk. Yeah. You know, we're all walking out to the cars and just falling over, but you'd hop in the car and drive away. No worries at all. With the traction control turned off where possible and the stability control turned off where possible. And all they were wearing is winter tyres. But um, And then we drove them on uh, the Highlands Motorsport Park circuit the next day. Okay. And, you know, most things have plenty of grip on dry bitumen, particularly in a racetrack, but they were just so easy. Yeah, Just, you know, faultless. So, what was the highlight? What cars were there? There was uh, obviously the Crafter with the four motion system, but yeah, so Crafter, Amarok, and interestingly, the commercial focus vehicles, and therefore, you know, aimed at people who use their cars for work, uh, were the ones that uh, wouldn't let you turn off the systems altogether. The traction aids, okay. So, which makes sense. You know, you want everything there if you're working with your car. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really hard to, as a result, it was really hard to send them in the wrong direction. So <laughs> even on ice, pretty hard to crash, Yeah, <laughs> put yeah. it that way. Which is good. Mm. That's, yeah, a, totally. that's a benefit. <laughs> and, you know, the uh, the Golf R, uh, we had a steer of as well. It lets you turn off all the traction and stability. And that car, I tell you, there's, I, I'm yet to experience a circumstance where the car doesn't excel. <laughs> uh, outstanding. Bit of a fan. Oh, aren't we all? Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> we said before it's like a cheap version of a Porsche. You can't afford a Porsche, get one of those. Yeah. Oh, and it rides well and, you you know, there's no low-hanging body bits. There's mm. no wing on the back. There's plenty of room for four people inside. So we heard Good um, fuel consumption. Volkswagen uh, claiming that about 50% or a bit more than 50% of their model lineup sales is four motion. Yeah, balanced across uh, commercial vehicles and um, passenger and SUV, yeah. And look, a lot of that's because... 100% of Tiguan's uh, all-wheel yeah. drive. Yeah. So if you buy a Tiguan, it's all-wheel drive. Yeah. But um, the uh, that's more than double the, the industry average of 22%, apparently. Yeah. So um, I wouldn't take it as a measure of Australians choosing all-wheel drive. I think it's more about Australians choosing SUVs and scoring all-wheel drive as a, as, a, as a freebie. Yeah. But, you know, it's... Um, it's good to see that they're all equipped with all the right stuff. Yep. Imagine how many they could sell if they called it Quattro. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I love about the snow farm where you just were? The last time I was there, they were telling me they've got a, a section set aside for testing autonomous cars. Huh. Because the hardest thing to teach an autonomous car is to drive in snow and ice. Because right. you know, it's very hard to stop them, etc. And it's very hard for them to see signs once they get covered in ice and so on. Yeah. So they have a section there where they're working on that. Wow. And it, it's not because of the white... Sort of oh, yeah. So, so many things with the cameras and so on are hugely difficult. So right. all of the car companies are working on it because they can only work in their, in their summer down here. The, they've set aside a special area there, hidden away to test autonomous cars for wow. those conditions. It's very cool. So we only saw one corner of this place, but it is just, you know, it's hard not to liken it to a James Bond <laughs> set. It's yeah. just awesome. And it's in New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. Good on them. It's been a, it's been a bit of a theme. There's been a few manufacturers taking people over to New Zealand to experience the snow farm. A couple of weeks ago, uh, our very own James Cleary went over, and there was no snow. So, oh, no. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, in New global warming's having its taking its toll on Queenstown. They're having a pretty quiet ski season, apparently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a bit of a shame, given it's a wonderful part of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had to finish up by about lunchtime. <laughs> really <laughs> the ice soft. was melting. Yeah, even at this time of year, guys. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not Plenty good. Of sun and pretty warm too yet we all drive cars so we're all partially to blame so yeah. uh, anyway moving on as long as you the don't work in an industry that encourages people to buy them i yeah. think guilt free. um yes uh guilt-free life is what we're living right That's here right. Um, so let's move on to what's been in our garage uh in the last week or so and uh, i'll start off with uh the ford ranger wild track now ford ranger is 
absolutely kicking some goals. It's one of the biggest selling vehicles in Australia. The 4x4 version is often outselling the 4x4 version of the Hilux, uh, which is pretty phenomenal. Which means itself. it's all private sales. Yeah. Too, mm. or largely private sales. Yep. So and Australians and are choosing this car. And it's yep. an advertisement for styling, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's what it is. It looks so good. And no one's, uh, well, not many people are buying the uh, lower grade 4x4 XL and XLT, uh, sorry, XLS. Um, they're moving to the XLT and the wild track so that's where we're focusing a bit of attention um the obviously the wild track is just over sixty thousand dollars which is quite a bit of money for a vehicle uh that doesn't even have a boot um well it kind of does a huge kind of got a boot it's got a huge boot (laughs) and with the wild track it's got one you can shut yes it does the um put your shopping in there and it's going to fly everywhere yeah yeah, and you might not be able to reach it ever again unless you can climb in because um, it's <laughs> it's it's a big jump into the back there. Um, so the one that we had uh, is the two-liter bi-turbo four-cylinder. So it's got the new downsized turbo engine, which has more grunt than the 3.2-liter five-cylinder that it replaces and also is a lot quieter. And it has a 10-speed automatic, which goes back to your comment about automatic transmissions. Yeah. Is 10 too many? It's, well, whoever would use the op, the manual option with that many gears? Have you tried it? Like you're in the t- you just get bored. Ten, nine, eight, seven. Oh, I'm tired. <laughs> just put it back and drive. The only time I can imagine using the manual uh, option would be when you're towing and you're trying to use engine braking, which is even it's then, good yeah. to have that yeah. versatility of engine braking. Yeah. Um, but with a two liter, you are theoretically. I mean, I haven't tested this, but with a two liter, you've got less braking potential because mm. mm. you've got less compression to slow you down. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just utterly know. bizarre to me that that car has a two liter engine when you look at it. It's yeah. like having a lion with a kitten's heart. Like what <laughs> is and the, we all thought the Amarok was crazy be? when it launched with the yeah. two liter yeah. and here we are with the, the Ranger. Well, yeah, even uh, I remember Ford pointing and laughing essentially at mm. VW going, you can't do a 2 liter you come on. Yeah. Um, yet they <laughs> launched with do. a 2.2 liter anyway. So Anyway, um, it's yeah, yeah. just an Is interesting one. Uh, we've we've done a, a load test in the vehicle to see what it was like with you know a bit of weight in the back, um, yep. <clears> and uh, there's a video on that coming up very soon. And we've done all this before, but the reason why we keep doing it is because they keep changing the car. Yeah, you know, they've just added AEB to yep. it across the range. I think the Wild Track had it before, but they keep changing it. Yes, and, and it's been around for eight years. But I've not driven one. Is it good? You've not driven a Ranger? No. Oh, not a Wild Track. Oh, Wild yeah. Track. Okay. Yes, it's good. Um, to to cut to the chase, it's probably one of the best utes you can buy. Yeah. Um, I would actually for work think, and play. I would think that the XLT makes more sense um, from a you know value for money perspective. But if you really like the styling of the Wild Track, mm. and seemingly heaps of people do, they love the orange paint for one thing. <laughs> and people are adding that sailplane as well to XLTs left, front, and center. Yeah. Which Mm. I don't like the fact that it eats into your, the versatility of your cargo area. Yeah. The other thing I don't like is the roll tonneau cover. Yes. Which sounds great, but in practice, the moment you get any grains of sand in there, it likes to yeah. jar and won't shut. And, and also, it eats into the space so much at the far end of the tub yeah. that you you really Limits are limited. Across, yeah. Across the entire... But you do get the security, so there's there's... Two different ways you can look at it, I guess. But moving on. But the suspension's pretty well sorted for oh. such a heavy duty. Moving Luckily, there's on. There's hardly now. any sand in Australia, so it'd be fine. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about what you've been driving, Mr. Corby. Something a little bit more exciting than a Ford Ute. This is why I couldn't get into a wild track. I was busy driving an 812 super fast Ferrari, which is uh, probably the Ferrari I've liked least out of all Ferraris. Wow. Which is. Uh, wow. Isn't it supposed to be like the Halo car? Well, is it the Halo car? I mean, it's. it's uh, the engine's in the wrong place. It's a V12. It's you know, it's all that stuff that it's a range topping car. But to me, the Halo car is obviously the new one, the Stradale or, an, or a 488. That to me is a Ferrari. This thing's just big, heavy, and it wants to kill you. Oh, it desperately wants to kill you. Though. There's no question. <laughs> well, I drove the FF uh, and found it surprisingly playful from the rear, which mm. I really enjoyed. And that with the you know the lovely linear uh, Atmo V12. Was pretty exciting. How do you find it compared to the it's F12? Not, the FF's all right, but I think it's. Oh, it's not the FF, I meant F12. The F12, the F12's all right, but this is just. Um, it's the fact that you can't use all the power. Like, mm, just yeah. saying a car, a Ferrari has too much power, does feel like saying, you know, Angelina yep. Jolie's too attractive. But uh, <laughs> it, it just. 
in a straight line, you can't apply even more than half throttle without the thing trying to spit sideways and kill you. Or you, mm. or if you're lucky, you'll just get wheel spin. Right. But you can't apply the power. Like, and I, I, I hate to imagine what it's like to drive in the wet, except that I don't have to, because the last time I drove it, it was snowing in Italy, and that was sheer terror. But um, <laughs> this I thing, it's the just, photos of that. Wow. It's, it's mental. But it's, you know, it feels heavy. It feels long. It's incredibly wide. Everything about it is difficult. So the only thing, the only place it would make sense is on an autobahn or the Italian yeah. autostrada. But, but here, but. but. It is gorgeous. Is it though? I if, don't know. if you're looking on YouTube, uh, you'll be able to see the images of the car behind us. Um, have your say in the comment section, but yeah. I reckon it is and beautiful. But park one next to a 458 or a 488, which one would you take? Different home? type of car. Different type of car. But in terms of sheer physical beauty, uh, though. I would take a 458 any day. Of the well, exactly. Week. I love that's, that car so much. That's that's perfect for Ari design. But this is just me. It's too heavy. Yeah. Too much nose, too much proboscis. You know, it's like, <laughs> and when you're in it, all you can see is these massive nostrils. There's a bonnet going on forever and these massive nostrils in front of you, which I think are also trying to kill me. They look like they want to inhale you through the windscreen. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's colourful. It's also uh, rather expensive, I thought. I didn't look at the price until I took it back, which I tend to do. $978,000. It's a million-dollar car. It's a million-dollar car. It's tested because it's a, a tailor-made Ferrari, which means it comes with many, many oh, options. the Marone one. The Marone the one, yes. The paint alone, the I think, is 40, $48,000 for the paint. Yeah. Uh, yes, so it's, it's it was alarmingly expensive. Wow. At the other end of the scale, Mal, uh, you've been driving something on an international launch. Uh, yeah, so it wasn't in the garage and it wasn't this week, but it's my first opportunity to talk about it on the podcast. The Mazda Back CX-30. You. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> You're right, mate. It's the Mazda CX-30 for all the players out there. Uh, <laughs> the big, big important question is what is it and why? Okay, well, what is it? It's an SUV that will sit between the CX-3 and the CX-5, and you think, oh, why is it, you know, this sounds like Goldilocks. But um, we know from our own data that people are either searching SUV or seven-seat SUV. No one's searching for small, mid-size, small, mid-size, anything like that. They might search under $30,000, under $40,000, whatever, but that doesn't actually define the size. So the manufacturers are rolling out you know, filling every gap they can to mm -hmm. to to sate this broad demand for this shape of vehicle. Right. And the CX thirty is a bit like a Qashqai, a bit like a Jeep Compass, a bit like a Eclipse Cross, a bit like an HRV even. And Kia Seltos. And the Kia Seltos as well. Mm. Uh, so we all thought the Seltos was going to be a venue, which is smaller than Kona, but Seltos is sub sportage bigger than Kona. Yeah. Um, all these little gaps are filling in. It's all becoming a bit more interesting and uh, giving the buyer more options. I think we're just what we're seeing here is the SUV segment mimicking what the passenger car segment was 20 years ago. So there were so many different uh, small cars you could get like from different brands mm. and now you're just seeing multiple different entry points into the SUV range so they can get you in on the smallest one and move you up as you get older and then probably get you back to the small one when you're on your last car. Or you you know, you walk into the showroom and you've got this specific set of needs and they've got a much better chance of going, that's the one for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so and does, it, does it feel more like a CX-3 or more like a CX-5? It's, it's closer externally to a CX-3, but it's closer internally to a CX-5. So you can get a pram in. You can get a pram in, and the the whole design motivation for the boot was full size pram. Right. The the chief engineer showed us that, and I'm like, bang on. It's that's very important to me. That that's a big <laughs> motivation to have, isn't it? Uh, yeah. You know, if you want to appeal to that part of the market, you know, that's if you can't afford you if you can't afford a CX5 and you want an SUV, then you'll shop elsewhere. Or if you mm. live in Newtown and you know parallel parking every time you come home yeah. is a pain in the neck. Mm. You want the smallest exterior possible. Yeah. But it, to me, it represents a coming of age for Mazda as well, in that they're sort of combining genuine practicality with their. Uh, you know, gorgeous Kodo looks, mm -hmm. and the car still looks good. It doesn't look like a box. And so, what's it going to cost? Because we, we, th yeah, obviously, the CX three ranges from just on twenty to about mm. forty. CX five is from thirty ish to about fifty. So it's obviously going to be in that gap somewhere. Yeah, all they're saying, all they're saying to us so far is that um, it'll overlap with CX three and CX five, which yep. is elementary, mm. and it'll be in the same you know four trim levels as the new Master three. Uh, importantly, it's basically the new Mazda 3 under the skin. Okay. So it's the all-new platform. Uh, it's on a different wheelbase to the 3, so don't presume it's just a jacked-up 3. It's a completely different um, set of body pressings. Um, but it's, you know, Got sized appropriately. 
CarPlay, indeed. <laughs> but also the other great thing is the interior, uh, aside from the boot, the interior packaging goals were, or goal, was to seat four adults of 184 centimetres. So that, I think that's four mats. Yeah. Uh, so two behind Four two mats. Wow. Yeah. Which for such a small car is, you know. Not even I would want to be in that car. No. <laughs> like, that's with a bit three, too much. Three more of you. Because it's a bit too much me. Because <laughs> the conversation? Or? Yeah, pretty much. It sounds like there's enough room though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, interesting. Um, well, <coughs> we look forward to seeing the uh, CX-30 on Aussie shores and it's due in uh, next year? Q1. Next year. Early next year. So it might not be the sales leader next year, but... There's a good chance it's going to appeal to a lot yeah. of people. Yeah. Now it's a nice drive too. Moving on to uh, that important man in everyone's lives, it's time for Musk Watch. Okay, so uh, we're going to start off with uh, an autopilot fail. This week, um, a driver has blamed autopilot for smashing into a series of traffic cones on a freeway, saying that the AEB system totally failed when it was needed most. And um, judging by what was in the lane next to him, a truck towing another truck, uh, this could have been a it's lot a worse. Lot All momentum. that ended up happening was obviously the car just ran into 11 traffic cones <laughs> in a row um, before realizing, oh, wait, I should probably stop. Um, Had the driver not retaken control at that point? No. No? Um, Just having a, having a nap? Uh, well, Watching you know, his iPad? It, uh, it comes down to this. I mean, Electric, the uh, US publication, uh, says that, well, it was funny because the system really should have figured out something was wrong after it hit the first cone yeah. before squashing <laughs> 11 of them. Anyway, you can see the footage on our YouTube uh, version of the show and see what you think. Make your own call on whether you should be trusting autopilot or not. <laughs> so is, to what degree is the owner kicking up a stink? Oh, he's just posted the video on YouTube and uh, into a different bunch of different forums, had a whinge at Tesla online. Okay. And I think, you know, these sorts of things, They because Tesla basically has cameras in all their cars and records everything that happens and will feed all that data back to its development team and go, oh, that happened, that shouldn't have happened, now we can implement a fix. Mm. Um, which is smart. Uh, but also scary because mm. why wouldn't it have picked up that there was something in front of it? Instantly. It mm. But ultimately, it also, the cars make it very clear that the onus is on you. Yeah. Mm. No matter what happens, but the, it's, it's the, really there for something to go, oh, that's clever, isn't it? Rather the, than over to you, car. Yeah, take your hands off. The yeah. problem is that I think people do just consider that it is autopilot. It is yeah. like, it's going to fly the plane and land it for the you. The name is misleading. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so and I think they've worked recently to rebrand it to a different type of automated driving system plus mm. two or whatever but uh yeah i i uh watched the footage and i was a bit like ah oh, that's a bit of a that's a bit of a shame <laughs> stuff up but it could have been a lot worse yeah. so uh speaking of worse um the share price for tesla uh has had a, a bit of a bump uh of its own um dropping more than a tenth of the share value they were $254.86 this time last week and this week they're $228.82 which is off the back of the news that the company reported a $408 million US loss in its second quarter so a big big loss for the company um and as, as if things couldn't get worse for them, the company's chief technology offer, officer, uh, JB Strobel, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, has decided he's off. He's gone. He's done. <laughs> so chief technology officer leaving, um, share price hitting the, hitting the brakes, uh, big losses. And this is all off the back of the fact that, well, not off the back of the fact, it's despite the fact <laughs> that they built more cars in the last quarter than ever before, uh, 95,356 cars. But things are looking grim. Grim. Dire. I think Musk's moved on. Did you see he's uh, talking about threads in your brain now? Yes. So this yeah. is his next thing. I think he's more excited about that. You know, he's a bit like the shiny thing. So I think he's really excited about that Just technology, like which will put he threads is. into your brain so you can talk to, you can operate machinery with thoughts. Yes. And like I think if you can pull that off, there's going to be a lot more money than that in that than there will be in Teslas. Yeah. And we, we spoke about that last week on the show. And, and the update this week was that Microsoft apparently is investing a billion dollars into that. Billion. A wow. billion dollars. Buy a few Teslas. And that the idea, like, you know, 
he wants to be everywhere. There's no doubt about that. He even wants to be in your brain even more than he already is. <laughs> but um, the, the the thing is, he wants to combine yeah brain power with computer power to give people. Uh, who might have disabilities, for example, to give them more control of themselves or control of their bodies through computers. The ability Mm. to work. The ability to work. The ability to do all sorts of stuff. Um, And I I did read a quote this week that said that this is the most important advancement in human nature ever. Mm, It's one of those things, it's one of those moves that can change everything, really will. And what, uh, remember we we were at a thing, Matt, a couple of years ago where they were saying how um, sort of prosthetic Robotics was a big development area. This yeah. this is a step beyond it. Yeah, it's going yeah. right back to the source. Yeah, if you connect that to robotics. If you can control the robot with your mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So but, this, um, I just think, hello, typing while you're driving, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the distraction level there, but yes, I'm with you. Yeah. Uh, it I would, it'd, yeah, anyway. It'd save a lot of time when you drive in from I'd get so much more out of life yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I wasn't sitting on the M2. Well, you just engage autopilot, and then yeah, all of a sudden oh, you engage God. autopilot in your brain as well. Yeah. Um, well, so, you could be swanning through Tuscany, you know, well, that's right. so <laughs> sending me stories. <laughs> Absolutely. But I mean, let's not forget that Audi promised 2018 was the year we'd be hands off, eyes off. Yeah. That's what they promised would happen in a car, and uh, supposedly their cars can do it already, but not one government in the world will let them try it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And but they're I saying mean, read a paper. Well, They'll be able to read the paper. Ford was saying at CES a couple of years ago that they'll have a car without a steering wheel in 2020. 2020 is mm. next year. Yeah. That's not going to happen. Well, it's BMW not just told next me. year. It's five, five yeah. months from now. Yeah. The yeah. BMW uh, design team said that she was saying her favourite thing is a steering wheel now that can move so I can say, don't like my driving? You drive. And she said they, they're working on that car. So they're yeah. saving a fortune on left-hand drive, right-hand drive. Oh, that'd be so, so good. The, the steering wheel will pop into the dash if we don't want it, but you can also pull it out and I can slide it over to you and you can drive. Wow. And she, she's seen that. She's talking about, a, you know, that's a concept they're working on. But when? She didn't say when. She said it's her favourite thing that they're working on. Yeah. You get think the engineering side of it is. From either side of the car. And it's crazy, yes. Gee. Yes. So... Uh, Let's just uh, finish off Musk Watch this week with Big a, Musk Watch. A, a Twitter <laughs> chat. <laughs> um, so obviously uh, Elon might have might have uh, been uh, wrapped over the knuckles uh, re- in recent times for not giving credit where it's due. So he posted a uh, an image on Twitter and basically didn't say who did it, or what it was, or why he posted it, but was just like, "Yeah, this is cool," mm. but didn't tell anyone what it was, how they could find out more, blah, 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 blah. Which so, lets you think that he's... Yeah, he did it. Maybe I did it. Yeah. yeah. So um, he's done it again, um, but this time he was quoting a T-shirt at a recent Hyperloop competition. So the T-shirt reads, technically alcohol is a solution. And <laughs> Musk just Nerd. said that. He just, he just wrote that. Uh, and then he uh, tweeted that at 9.05 before adding at 9.07... Um, that I just saw that on a T-shirt at the Hyperloop competition. So in his own thread of the same tweet. So he's he's realised, hang on, I've done it again, uh, but now I've done it right. Did he realise that did one of his assistants say, uh, Elon, quick, yeah. <laughs> fix it. You did this two uh, minutes uh, ago. Done this again. It's already got 40,000 likes. <laughs> anyway, so hopefully old mate uh, keeps his fingers off the keyboard a little bit. He has been going a little bit Twitter crazy lately. So um, There's a couple just, of those in America. Yeah. Yeah, well... <laughs> Funny that uh, it's like stabbing someone and then just pulling the knife out quickly. No, never happened. Wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? Have you done well, that, Mel? Uh, you, you on that Twitter, on that <laughs> pretty violent, on that crazy <laughs> note. Uh, that's it. We've reached the finish line. Thank you, Mr. Corby. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Flynn, thank uh, you, for coming Mr. in and Campbell. having a chat. Oh, it was good. It was good fun. <laughs> um, and also, thanks to Mr. Pritchard as always for putting up with our nonsense. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please tell other people about us tools and even if you're not get it off your chest by search of a cars guide on facebook and instagram using the hashtag cg podcast or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au if you're an itunes listener please rate and review us and we're sitting at five stars after 92 episodes which is pretty amazing just spread the word for us and remember you can also watch us on youtube until next week i'm not doing a joke because that's james's job so see you later Good job <laughs>